So we talked about why we have various lasers in order to avoid the fluorescence issue. And one of the most innovative approaches to that was when Bruce Chase and co-workers developed Fourier transform Raman spectroscopy. The way this works, and again, here's that energy level. I told you we would keep coming back to that. And here's our first electronic state. So that's E equals one. And this is E equals zero. And then V equals zero and one. And remember, what we said was if we supply sufficient energy for the molecule to make it up to that electronic state, then we'll end up with the very bright fluorescence emission, which I'm calling nu F, okay? But what was realized was that if we lowered the energy of that laser sufficiently to the point where we didn't make it up to that excited state, we only go here to this virtual state, then we would see only the Raman scatter. You would not give the molecule sufficient energy to approach that excited uh, electronic state and hence fluoresce. So the fluorescence photon wouldn't happen. You would just have your Stokes scatter that you've come to expect for the Raman. How does this work? Well, on the Thermoscientific Nicolay IS50 FTIR spectrometer, we have a Raman module that fits right into the sample compartment. It doesn't require sitting on the side. The older previous generation instruments had uh, a large module that sat on the side, uh, but this module just fits right in the sample compartment and it utilizes the interferometer and detector scheme of the Nicolay IS50 spectrometer to take care of its business. Basically, this is how it works. And remember, this laser right here now has a frequency of about, or it is, 1064 nanometers. So you have a diode laser that shines onto the sample at 1064. Then the Raman scatter comes off, and that Raman scatter is treated as if it was a source and that's fed right into the interferometer of the Nicolay IS-50. Now, I'm not going to go into the functioning of a Fourier transform infrared. There are other videos on this page that show that over in the FTIR Academy. But what we have here, the beam splitter, the light recombines, and then it goes off to a detector, which I'll draw simply as a an eyeball or something like that. So you've got a very simple looking spectrometer. You put it right in the sample compartment, you run the samples, the, the Raman scatter comes off, you collect it using the detector. The two detectors that have been used traditionally for the Raman systems, the FT Raman systems, are a germanium detector, large germanium detector with a cryogenically cool detector. Um, and the room temperature indium gallium arsenide detector. With the improvement in the preamps and the improvement of all of the electronics that go with them, the in-gas detector is almost as sensitive as the germanium. There are very few samples for which you need the germanium detector's extra cost and extra complexity. <clears throat> the in-gas works just fine for most purposes. So why doesn't everybody do this? And it comes back to that big problem. You don't get something for nothing. It's the one over lambda to the fourth efficiency, which is the negative to this. Yes, you're avoiding fluorescence, but at one over lambda to the fourth, where lambda is now way up here at 1064 nanometers, so you've got an extremely long wavelength laser, the efficiency drops in a hurry. So, I've actually had recently a set of samples that came in that we were unable to get good signals for on the FT Raman, but we got great signals for at 532. I've had the reverse as well, plenty of fluorescent samples for which the FT Raman works beautifully. In general, if the sample is like a white powder or a pharmaceutical tablet or something like that, FT Raman works brilliantly. I went to 
a pharmaceutical company and ran sample after sample one day asking them to find something that was hard. Everything just kept popping up giving beautiful signals on the FT Raman. On the other hand, there are times when it doesn't work as well. As I said, this other sample I received just recently. We'll talk some to samples later, what works well and what doesn't. So that's the basic idea behind FT Raman. You're avoiding fluorescence by not giving it enough energy. You're worried about the one over lambda to the fourth efficiency, giving you a come down on it. And it just fits right into the core seat of the spectrometer and you're on your way. So FT Raman, we were looked at. Now let's look back just a little bit at some of the theory of Raman and then move into the Raman instrumentation using diffraction systems.